Well, friends, good evening to you. It's about seven o'clock. And I want to welcome everyone who's joining us on Zoom and those who are over on YouTube as well. It's great that we can come to the end of this beautiful day that we've all been enjoying. We've had such a wonderful few days of uh, summer and it's lovely to spend the Lord's Day and see the beauty of creation all around us. I do pray that you will know what it is to rest in the Lord and in his love today and to be refreshed by his word and by the worship of his people. It's always very encouraging when we're able to gather around the word. I look forward so much to Sundays and to sharing the gospel morning and evening with you. And I do so look forward to that time when we will be able to gather publicly and to gather and to encourage one another by being together in the same place as churches. Most of you will know that the Free Church has issued some guidance to our congregations in the last few days in the light of the advice of the Scottish government. And it is likely that there will be many more weeks, probably some more months, before we will be at the stage of being able to transition back to doing most of our church life in public gatherings once again. But we are looking very carefully at um, making steps towards that. And the Deacon's Court will be meeting in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and I know that there are subgroups who are already busy looking at the things that need to be done in terms of signage and in terms of practical measures to ensure that when the time is right, that uh, people who are not shielding uh, are able to come to public worship once again. But for now, we thank God for one another and that we can come together online and encourage one another with a phone or whatever. The change that has happened in the last few days is significant. It means that we can now, uh, in small numbers, visit one another in a public place or in one another's gardens or whatever. Uh, maybe if it's only one visit a day, it is better than no visit. And so, uh, I hope we'll be able wisely to take advantage of the opportunity to encourage each other and to spend some time with those who are in need of encouragement. May God answer our prayers for our communities, for our city of Inverness, for the Highlands and for this whole nation. And may God help us to be witnesses and bright, hope-filled witnesses in a time when so many are fearful and frightened. My plan tonight for our evening fellowship is that we would um, begin with prayer and the reading of God's word and thinking about especially a message for families and having thought about what the gospel uh, says to families that we might then uh, share a bit of the story maybe not quite the testimony, but a bit of the story of one of the older members of our congregation, William McEwen, who will be very well known to those of you who've been involved with the Free North for a long time. So that's our plan for this evening, and I hope it will do our hearts good. As we come then to worship God together, let me share with you some uh, information and uh, some encouragement for worship from the New City Catechism. You maybe are familiar with that uh, revision of the catechism that's been produced in the last few years in the United States. It's very helpful for children and for adults. Question 20 in the New City Catechism asks the question, who is the Redeemer? Who is the Redeemer? The answer is the only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin 
himself. Jesus Christ is the only redeemer of God's elect people. The one who became God and man in one person to bear the penalty of our sins. That is our redeemer. And that, of course, is scriptural. Verses like 1 Timothy 2, 5 teach this. There we read, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And one of the resources that the New City Catechism has is a prayer for every catechism question. And there's a very helpful prayer for that question and answer about the Redeemer being Jesus. And perhaps as I turn to lead us in prayer just now, I can read to you the words of that prayer from the New City Catechism. Precious Redeemer, before the world began, you loved us. You gave up your glory to bear our shame. You glorified your Father by obeying him all the way to the cross. You deserve our praise, thanks and worship. We have no hope but in you. Amen. That's a, a, a wonderful prayer indeed. He loved us before time began. Let us pray. Merciful God, you took flesh in order to come into this broken world, this sorrowing world, and this world where every birth leads at last to tears and indeed to parting. We are born to die and we are living in a world of sighing and of brokenness. Everyone that we know struggles and suffers. Every family that we know struggles and suffers. And yet there's such glory and such love and such wonder as well all around us. What a strange world we live in. It looks like the home that you designed and built for Adam and Eve, and yet it is affected by the shadow of sin and the fall and your righteous judgment. So we pray that we would have eyes to see beyond the confusion of the ruin that is in our hearts and the ruin that is in society, and that we would by faith see that you are making all things new and calling people to obedience, to faith, to repentance, to put their trust and their hope in you and in Jesus the Redeemer, for in him, we have the door to a new heaven and a new earth. In him, we have the new temple. In him, the dwelling place of God is with mankind. May we offer you our praise through Jesus, our love through Jesus, our thanks and our worship through Jesus. We ask you to bless us together this evening and in the days to come. Remember our sister churches, we remember today, as we've prayed already today, our sister church in Dundee, and we ask your blessing on them in the time of vacancy and as they work, particularly as they work with Charleston Church Plant, that your blessing would be upon that church and the work in Tayside. We ask your blessing on all our sister churches. Remember the Mark Inch Church Plant, we give you thanks for what we were able to hear this morning about their work and we ask that there would be encouragement and strength for your people there. And now Lord we pray your rich blessing on the work and witness of our congregation. Hear our prayers for Jesus sake. Amen. Friends I just remind you that we have Christianity Explored tomorrow evening. If you were thinking of coming and you missed the first session it's not too late to come along. If you have been able to get into the Zoom meeting tonight, the same uh, codes will get you into Christianity Explored at eight o'clock tomorrow. But it would be nice to maybe drop an email to office at freenorthchurch.org to say you're hoping to come or an email to Sandy Finlay to say you hope to come. The details are in our uh, weekly email. 
you've got two or three more days if you'd like to send me a little video clip, uh, especially of the young people doing their challenge. It would be great to get a few more of these. Um, I didn't give you very long to do that, so I'll maybe extend the month of May by a few more days, but they're really, really good if you videoed yourself or you're planning to do it to get those emailed to Ian as soon as you can. If any of you are willing to do a Bible reading, maybe in our morning service, or to share something in our evening fellowship, or to be part of the welcome uh, that we often will share online, do drop me a line or phone me about that. It would be good to make some progress in involving more and more people in being the face of our congregation to our city and to all who share in our worship. And I'll mention again that we hope in the next few weeks to do a wee bit more with the men and with the, some of the younger men, single guys and young uh, husbands and fathers. Uh, if you would like to be part of a group for guys, maybe if you have ideas about that and what would be helpful, I'd love to hear from you about that. Going to read God's word together now. Our reading tonight is from the letter of James and from chapter four, James chapter four, and the opening of James chapter four. Let's hear God's word. James asks the believer she was writing to, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading from his word. I might just ponder on the first verse there for a moment. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? What is true of uh, the adults that James was writing to in his letter is true of us in the church. It's true of us in society. It's true of us in family life, in our relationships with one another. And it's true of mothers with their children and fathers with their children as well. What causes fights among us? our hearts, our desires. What causes a fight between parents? What causes a fight in the leadership team of a church? What causes a fight in the presbytery or on the floor of a general assembly? What causes a fight between believers or between you and someone who is not a believer in Jesus? James says, fighting and quarreling comes from the heart's desire to be in control, from the heart's desire to get the last word, 
from the heart's desire to have things, to covet for things, to desire things. And some people go so far as to be violent or even to kill because of what they want and what their heart desires. Motivation, heart motivation needs to be controlled and it needs to be disciplined. I've got a few statements to share with you tonight and I think they're really helpful. I found these in a, a booklet I've been using on the gospel-centered family and in that booklet it's by Tim Chester and Ed Mall. He has these four statements that I find very helpful. I just, I'll just list them, I'll just read them and I think it helps us to address what our hearts want, what our hearts desire the things that cause friction and trouble and disagreement. Number one, God is great. God is in control. And if that's true, and if we believe it, we don't have to be in control. Many a fight I've been in or involved with has to do with trying to be in control. But if we trust that God is in control, we can deal with this danger. God is great, so we don't have to be in control. The second idea, God is glorious, so we don't have to fear others. If we are more impressed with God and his beauty and his glory than human beings, we will not fear human beings or be trying to please people all the time. I wonder if sometimes our personal relationships are spoiled because we're always looking over our shoulder, being a people pleaser. Well, if we start by being a God pleaser, we will get the people pleasing in the right order and in the right place. Please God first, and then maybe sometimes we'll not be so troubled about what people say or think about us. God is great. We don't have to be in control. God is glorious. We don't have to fear others. The third idea, very helpful, God is good. And because God is good, we don't have to look elsewhere. We can put our trust in the mercy and the love and the provision of God. We don't find that it's just our, our job or how successful life looks or how cool we look or how cool our children can be made to look that will make life have meaning. The love and the goodness of God will be enough. God is great. God is glorious. God is good. And fourthly, God is gracious. He's a God who is good to us, whether we deserve it or not. A God who is giving all the time out of his love and grace. God is gracious. So we don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to prove ourselves to God or to anybody else or to earn the approval that we might be craving. God is gracious. He will accept you as the parent or the spouse or the church member or the family member that you are. And yes, he'll deal with the things that need to be repented of in your heart and in mine. And yes, he'll change us. But we don't have to worm our way into God's good books. We are accepted by grace, even though we are full of sin and even though our hearts are in a mess. Well, I thought I found these four things helpful and I wanted to share them with you for a few minutes tonight. Let me just apply this to. Uh, fathers and mothers and families for a moment because on Sunday evenings I've been thinking with you about how the gospel is good news for families and we want God-centered, Christ-centered, gospel-centered families and homes. If you find that there's a lot of conflict in your home life, maybe with a teenager or with a toddler or between both parents about the way to bring up our children or with an in-law or whatever, 
conflict. It's so draining and so difficult to cope with. Sometimes we are the source or the cause of that conflict or the way we handle it makes it worse rather than better. This bit of James, James chapter four, I think it's real medicine for our souls because it says, look, expect conflict. We will disagree, we will fall out, but understand why it's happening. The reason is not the thing we usually blame. I had a lot of stress. I was tired. I had a hard day. I wasn't feeling myself. The job isn't going well. What, these are the things that we always blame for conflict. But James says, start with your heart and start with your desires. Why is it that when my children were small, some days they had a really laid back dad who put up with their childish mistakes in a calm way. And some days they got the really crabbed father who was uh, unpredictable and would fly into an angry rage over little things. I wasn't consistent and I'm not consistent because of the desires of my heart because of my sinful desires. And if I realize that and admit it before God, surely that's halfway to fixing the problem and dealing with the problem and recognizing that by the grace of God, my heart can be changed and my desires can be changed. I wonder, and here's a question for those of you who are parents or who have children or grandchildren, do you ever catch yourself saying something like this about your child? If only they dot, dot, dot. If only they were more like their sister or if only they were more like somebody else's child. Do you, do you catch yourself saying things like that? It might be okay and it might be reasonable sometimes to think or say things like that, but quite often, we say things like that because we have a picture in our head of what the good and perfect family looks like. And we want that for ourselves. And we want it because it'll make us feel good or it'll make us look good. It's actually maybe an idol that we cherish of a very obedient child or a a very successful child who always passes their exams and who always has uh, the right kind of friends and what have you. That's maybe an idol in our heart that we want to be seen, to be really successful as a mother or a father or always getting our children well turned out and in church and on time and, and well behaved. If if we want these things for the right reasons, then the Lord bless you. But I, I think if your heart is like mine, we often want these things for very mixed reasons. And we're as well to sometimes admit that and maybe even be willing to confess our faults and even repent before our families and say, I'm not doing a very good job as a husband or as a dad. And I want Jesus to help me and to change me, but I've let you down. We want our children to trust Jesus and know Jesus, and we never want the way we are to be an obstacle to that, but rather to help people. James gives some really helpful advice to believers, which I think applies to, to mums and dads as well in James chapter one. And he writes there in James one verse 19, something that to me makes so much sense in every situation of misunderstanding or conflict or falling out. And it's really, it's not rocket science. James says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry 
for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. On my good days, I believe that and I try to live by it. But on many a day, I'm not quick to listen. I'm quick to judge. And I'm not slow to speak. I'm quick to speak. And I'm not slow to get angry. I'm quick to get angry. And I need to keep confessing that as a sin and asking for God's mercy and help and forgiveness because I want my life to have the fruit of the Spirit and to, to produce righteousness in others. I want to provoke others to come close to Jesus, not to draw back from him. So if you're a, a father listening to this, thinking about how it applies to you, if you're a mom listening to this, thinking about how it applies to you, there's God's wisdom. Slow down and listen. Listen to your spouse. Listen to well-meant and loving advice from others. Listen to your children. And listen especially to the Lord. His glorious gospel is for you and for your heart. And every one of us will make mistakes. But Jesus Christ, what were we thinking about a few minutes ago? What were we thinking about, about our God? He's great. He's in control. He's glorious. We have nothing to fear. He's good. We don't need to look past him. He's gracious. So start again tomorrow, Dad. Start again tomorrow, Mom. And don't be afraid because the gospel is for your heart and then you'll pass it on, that good news, that gospel, to your children as well. May our prayer be that God will help us to deal with the desires in our hearts that are sinful and that wage war and battle inside of us so that they don't destroy us. And they don't destroy our children. May we be in the grip of Christ so that Christ teaches us to submit to him. To teach our hearts to submit to him. And I'm going to finish with some words from 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, full of gospel, full of gospel hope. And I thank God that this is in his holy word. It's in... 2 Peter chapter 1, and it says this about the risen Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That means he's given you what you need to be a faithful wife or a faithful husband or a faithful father or a faithful elder or a faithful Sunday school teacher, or a faithful witness as an employee in your workplace. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. God is great. God is glorious. God is good. God is gracious. And in Jesus, his divine power has equipped us to live a life that glorifies God and a life of godliness. And he's gone beyond that. Peter goes on to say, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. In other words, you have been given what you need to become more like Jesus. You have been given all that you need to grow in Christian faith. There's hope, there's joy, there's peace. Father in heaven, bless the dads and give them good news from your gospel. Bless the mums and give them good news from your gospel. Bless our children and our children's children and may we never provoke them or exasperate them, but rather help them to learn to give their hearts to Jesus because they see mom and dad giving their hearts to Jesus. May we have godly homes, godly families. We pray for single moms and single dads. We pray for families where there has been a split. We pray for families that are struggling because of all kinds of external pressures. 
and crying to you for help and answers to prayer about money or housing and similar things. Lord, there are so many pressures, but in the midst of all these pressures, may our hearts be holy and may our hearts rest in peace because you are powerful and you are good and you love us and you love our homes and our families. We bring our homes and our needs to you and we thank you, Lord, that you've preached a word of good news to us through your son. May there be joy in our hearts because of Jesus and joy in our children's hearts because of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, uh, that's the Bible teaching for tonight, and I hope it was helpful. And if people have uh, questions or want to take anything further, I'd be very happy to hear from you, uh, maybe to hear from you um, um, privately by phone or whatever. Now, let me just take a little moment to uh, share with you a little bit about one of our older members. Mr. William McEwen. We see if I can uh, get this uh, to share with you. Yep. So, William McEwen. I'm sure many of you know Mr. McEwen. I've enjoyed speaking to him on the phone a few times since I came into the congregation. Of course, uh, he is the father of Ruth Finlay who many, many of you will know. And a few weeks ago, um, I heard a, a bit of William's story and I thought it would be helpful for him to share it with the wider church. He's in his 90s and he is a veteran of the Second World War. And Ruth went to see her dad and he told some of those stories uh, from his <laughs> wartime experiences. And it really was helpful, and I thought it might be nice, rather than having a guest tonight or someone from another church or a testimony that we might have shared with us, read to us uh, a story from probably our oldest member in the congregation, from Mr. McEwen. I've got a few pictures to share with you before we read this. And they set the scene for a story of D-Day. Uh, 76 years ago, this coming Saturday, was D-Day. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but the D in D-Day stands for day. So D-Day was day-day. It was the day of the invasion. And uh, the code name for the invasion was Overlord, but everybody called it D-Day, and they were counting down towards it. Just imagine the, the picture, if you can see it there, is of some Canadian uh, soldiers heading for one of those four beaches that were to be part of the invasion of northern France. Uh, and imagine the tension on board these launches uh, and landing craft as you approached uh, a hail of bullets and uh, all the, the things that were on the shore to prevent ships from getting close to uh, land and barbed wire and all kinds of other dangers that were ahead. Imagine how many young men lost their lives and how many would have prayed to the Lord Almighty in an experience like that. Well, one of these young men was William McEwen. There's another picture of some uh, soldiers approaching the shoreline, approaching the beach and getting ready to disembark. And uh, we can just imagine the noise, uh, the sun just coming up, daybreak and uh, chaos raining as bombs rained down and as the living and the dead were side by side. There's a picture, maybe as things were beginning to get a bit more established, of people wading uh, waist high, chest high in the waves and vehicles going into the water and some of them being, being salvageable and some of them being lost in the difficulty of it all. And here is a picture of Mr. McEwen himself at home and a picture of 
the Legion of Honor bestowed upon him by the French Republic. I believe that that is a great honor that uh, France has decided to bestow to all those still alive who fought for the liberation of Normandy and of France in 1944. And what a generation they were. We thank God that we have so many liberties and freedoms today, many of them uh, hard won by the generation of our parents and grandparents who lived through the Second World War. Statistics don't do justice to a day like D-Day. The 150,000 troops were landed on five beaches over one day, and then many, many hundreds of thousands more in the days that followed. There was fierce, fierce fighting in that whole area for many weeks before the breakthrough, uh, the breakout from that part of France uh, swept uh, the enemy uh, back across the, the rivers into Germany and led less than a, a year later to the defeat of the enemy. William says he is not a hero, but we are very grateful to him for his service and for his sacrifice and for his humility. And we are thankful that he is willing now at this stage in his life to share a few of his memories. Let me read a little bit of what Ruth wrote down about her dad. This is um, as he spoke to her. In 1944, I went to Hammersmith Town Hall and was posted to the second war office signals. After the war, I discovered that this was the top signal unit, a crack unit in army terms. Weeks before D-Day, we were ordered to go into battle order, which meant preparing our backpack and kit back for action and a move to little wool pits in Cambridgeshire. The whole British army was on the move so that the German leaders would not discover from which part of the English coastline the invasion would come. <coughs> At Little Wool Pits, I gained my motorbike license in half an hour, having never been on one before. I was shown the throttle, the brakes, and told to ride along one and a half miles of straight road. And then that was me, qualified. In early May, we were sent to a bombed area of East London to live in basic tents while awaiting instructions. On the 5th of June, the day before D-Day, we received orders to be ready. And on the evening of the 6th of June, we sailed down the River Thames to our landing crafts. There, there were uh, large amphibious vehicles, Thornycrofts. The enormity of it all was overwhelming. And I remember saying to God, if I come out of this, I will serve you always. I was not bargaining with God but I knew only that, that, that only he could protect me. Our Thornycrofts were loaded up with three motorbikes, a Jeep and our equipment lorries, housing all our communication gear. We were 17 men, one captain, one sergeant, three corporals, six technicians, five drivers, and one cook. We had to wait our turn to disembark at France. And as the Jeeps were driven off, they sank deep into the water. I had to go first with our jeep and it too sank. Help was at hand immediately by way of a tank with grappling irons and it pulled me out from the churning waters. I then had to wait in a shed to let the engine dry out. The next day was D-Day plus two. I was able to set off to join the rest of my group with just the help of a very simple map reference. When I arrived, my first order was to go to Bea, 15 miles away by motorbike, to, rep to repair equipment. After about 10 miles, a military policeman stepped out of a hedge and asked where I was going. His reply was, if you go much further on this road, you will be a German prisoner at best, or you will be shot at worst. I turned back and took another route to Bea, repaired the equipment, and returned safely to my unit. 
Before D-Day, a submarine cable had been laid from Portsmouth to within one mile of the French coast. And after D-Day, a splice was put in and we then ran it overland to a shell hole. My unit was chosen to be at the French end of three perfect telephone lines straight to headquarters in Whitehall and the British commander in chief. Every morning we phoned Whitehall to check that each line was in perfect working order. And for six months, we spent our days and nights intercepting enemy signals and relaying them to London. Once the Germans retreated, we moved behind them to Belgium. God has always kept his promises to me. He prevented me from drowning when at the age of three, I fell off the Greg Street Bridge in Inverness. And it's amazing to realize he did the same in the sea at Normandy. He caused that military policeman to tell me to go another way to avoid German capture. In all the difficulties I encountered throughout my life, the Bible has always comforted me and supported me. I always go to the Psalms and they delight me. I sing Psalm 25 with sorrow for all the time wasted in my youth when I didn't give God his proper place in my life and I wandered from him. And he quotes Psalm 25, my sins and faults of youth, do thou, O Lord, forget. After thy mercy, think on me, and for thy goodness, great. Then I can say with all my heart the words of Psalm 73. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I am with thee. Thou dost me hold by my right hand, and still upholdest me. Thou, with thy counsel while I live, wilt me conduct and guide and to thy glory afterward receive me to abide. Whom have I in the heavens high but thee, O Lord, alone, and in the earth whom I desire besides thee, there is none. My flesh and heart doth faint and fail, but God doth fail me never, for of my heart God is the strength and portion forever. And my prayer is in Psalm 116. Rest, O my soul, God has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have saved my soul from death, my feet from stumbling, and my eyes from tears, that I may live for you while I have breath. Well, I want to say amen to that and to express the thanks of our whole church family to Mr. McEwen, to William, and especially to Ruth for writing that down for us so that it could be shared with us all. And we're very moved by these memories of D-Day and the aftermath and the way the Psalms sustained William in wartime and through the whole of his life. May the same God who was there when the landing craft came ashore, may the same God sustain William and sustain us all to the end of our days. Ruth, I believe, is standing by to share a little bit more about her dad and particularly his involvement with the YMCA in Inverness. Would you like to tell us a wee bit about that, Ruth? We're not hearing you. There we are. I think we can hear you now. Right. Anyone who knows my father and has talked with him knows that he loves to tell a story and he has lots and lots of stories that he shares with people. One story that he told me recently was um, of a running race that happened when he was in school. He was about 12 or 13 he thinks and it was a school, it was a, a race that was open to anyone in the school and um, it was for some special occasion you can't quite remember what it was. Um, 
he practiced really hard for this race. He had been put into the race by his one of his teachers. And he was getting up extremely early in the morning and running round Glenurchet Road, round Tom Nahurich, along the canal and back to his house in Glenurchet Road. And then when that circuit became too easy, he went off before seven o'clock in the morning to the Milburn pitches and he practiced greater distances there. And on the race day, he was taken aback by all the older boys lined up with him. But one of the things about uh, my father is that he always keeps his word and finishing what you start is a very high priority for him. He raced and to his shock, I think he won the race. And this is the interesting thing. And it was something that made a big impact on his life and um, his whole life. And it was certainly something that he taught us as children. He says that winning is not what remains in his mind when he thinks of that race. The sports champion and head boy was a man, was a boy called Monty Hadley, and he was also running in this race. As he came over the finish line, he headed for dad and dad thought he was going to be in sort of trouble. He was going to have, Monty was going to say something to him. Um, instead of that, Monty stretched out his hand and he congratulated Dad and took his arm. Dad says that made a huge impact on his life, that our deeds are much stronger than our words. What we do in our lives shows much more than just simply saying things. And one of the things that I would say about my dad is that he knows his Bible and his catechism. And he has learned so much of these by heart. He's still learning pieces of the Bible, verses of the Bible by heart um, at 97. And this was something that he spoke with me this afternoon. He would say that he has been in many circumstances when he didn't have a Bible to hand. But having scripture stored in his mind was even better. Um, his love for his saviour is plain to see. And he often tells us on the way home from church how delighted he is to see people coming to church. And when we're standing in the pew singing Psalm 116, his voice always falters at these words, rest, O oh my soul, God has been good to you. Thank you so much. Uh, if it's okay, Angus, I've got one or two uh, just memories to share from the, 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 the book that was published. Yeah. Thank um, you. you may recognise the, the picture. There's not many of us who uh, remember Inverness as it used to be. This is the this is where McDonald's is now, on the at the bottom of Castle Street. And if you want to see these uh, figures, faith, hope, and charity, they're in front of the Ness Bank Church. This was the the YMCA building in Inverness right up until uh, the 1950s. And there are one or two uh, sections in the book. Um, one one well partly relating to the YM, but also relating to Madras Street that I just thought I would share with you. Um, so the, the author says that, that William's connection with the YMCA goes back many years, uh, back in fact to the early 1940s when he was still a schoolboy. Um, he was a chartered accountant and he was a const, constant behind the scenes supporter of Inverness YMCA since, it, since he first entered its doors as a young lad. Um, he says, as a teenager, I went to the YM on Castle Street for the billiards. And a, William's testimony gives more, yet more evidence of the way God used some of the YM's less churchy programs to bring boys in. Then I got called away and was away for some years. In 1948, I came back from studies in Edinburgh and took up with the YM again. And this is how it continues. He's always been a good friend to the YMCA. His support and expertise have been tremendously helpful to the club over the years. 
but he always plays down the contribution that uh, he, he make, made uh, to the efforts of the committee members. So this was the story of, of what happened in the 60s when the new building, which is the current building on Bank Street, was first suggested in 1968. Most people thought there was no hope of raising the funds. The project would have been abandoned if it hadn't been for Tom MacDonald. He tried just about every conceivable funding source, getting help from the Ganachy Trust, the Russell Foundation, and a good few others. Then he and the committee organized a very large sale of work. It netted a colossal sum at that time of £2,200. And although William didn't mention it, gall gallons of homemade fruit jam carefully prepared by William in his wife Dorothy's kitchen helped to make that sale of work a success. And then he talks about how he first became involved. He says, I first became aware of the YM when I was about seven years old as a result of regular visits to our neighbor's house by the president, Mr. Masson. He came every week after the evening, Sunday evening service at the YM. There was a Sunday evening after church a rally, as it was known, at eight o'clock. A few years later, when in the academy, I was introduced to the slower of the two billiard tables in the Castle Street YMCA by a school friend. And then he goes on to say, these were clandestine operations so far as my parents were concerned, because the game did not then enjoy the profile it now has. So it was considered rather shady, perhaps it didn't uh, appear on uh, television from the crucible with all the, the competitions and so on in those days. <clears throat> um, he, it continues, my close connection with the YM did not begin until the 50s, when I was asked to become auditor in the aftermath of the sale of the Castle Street building and the purchase followed by the unavoidable sale of the Palace Hotel. Ashvale, the hostel in Kilduffel Road, bought with part of the proceeds from the sale of Castle Street, had been lavishly furnished, but was showing heavy losses as a hostel. I recollect the caretaker saying that he was actually saving the YMCA money because whenever possible, he ironed out creases in the bed sheets without laundering them first and so got the beds ready for the next occupant. Uh, the record doesn't tell us what the auditor said to the uh, warden of the hostel. Uh, these were difficult days in the club due to the compulsory acquisition of the Castle Street property. The com committee invited me to attend their next annual general meeting and comment on the losses. In a short space of time, the YM had been reduced from what promised to be a well-endowed association to one in dire poverty. What it lacked though in, in, in finance, it, it certainly made up for in spiritual well-being. And in these days when differences of opinion occurred, I would bow to 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 15. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose land hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen, for they dealt faithfully, because I knew that several members of the committee were devoting their entire earnings, except that which was required for personal necessities to keep the YM afloat. The position was not unlike that of the early believers whose sacrificial giving is recorded in Acts chapter four and verses 34 and following. So these are a few thoughts on the YM, and then just a brief mention of the, the work in Madras Street. A, we're told in, the, in this chapter that William, along with his wife Dorothy, were involved in, in, the, in the work of the church and also in the work at the Madras Street Mission, where he became a superintendent, I think, following his, his father, who had been involved. A, and this, there's this story of his involvement in Madras Street. We invited the neighborhood children to come for a meeting which would be followed by a party. I left the cakes and goodies there in the afternoon. When I arrived in the evening, they'd all been stolen. The hall was full of children and I didn't know how I would deal with the situation. 
God dealt with it in his own way. A baker came to the hall with a load of cakes, which he said he was not able to sell. He offered them to me at no cost if I could use them. That was a very direct provision from the Lord. Uh, the Sunday school at that time, back in the, in the 50s, 60s, right through into the <coughs> 70s, uh, met at 12.30 after the, the morning service. And I spent a, a year there uh, in my final year uh, in school before uh, leaving Inverness. Um, we think that youth work has its challenges. Well, it had its challenges then. And these are two, these, these were, this was a story that Ruth's dad uh, told me about things that happened in the Sunday school. Apparently there were two days in the year when the children seemed to disappear. So the teachers would turn up and there were maybe just one or two uh, children uh, there waiting uh, to go into Sunday school. So what had happened? Well, one of these days was May Day in, in, in May, the beginning of the month. And apparently uh, the children would process out to the Clutty Well at Culloden on, on that day. So that was a reason why uh, they were, were not there on that Sunday in May. There was another Sunday in a, later on in the year, I'm not sure when, but again, the story was the same. Most of the children were, were missing. Uh, maybe Murder knows, or somebody who lives up in Skurgui, or, or Mike and Joan, but anyway, this what, was what happened. Um, at the entrance to Muirton House, there were two stone pillars with a lion on the top of each pillar. And apparently on a certain Sunday of the year, it was reputed that these lions would swap pillars and jump across. So the children would leave Markinch and head out to Muirton to uh, witness this, um, uh, this uh, scene, this event. Uh, and that's why they weren't there um, for Sunday school. So that that's uh, that concludes, I think, um, the, some of the, the stories we have from uh, Ruth's dad uh, and his involvement in the YM and also in in, in the Madras Street uh, mission. Thank you very much, Sandy. We really enjoyed these stories and these memories of uh, a fine man and uh, his many interests in life. It's lovely that he has such a, a legacy in the church on both sides of the river and in the community and through the YMCA as well. So thank you for sharing these things. And we thank God for William, and we're glad that he is still uh, doing so well at the age of 97. How wonderful. Well, thank you all, friends, for being with us tonight. I'll maybe ask Sandy if he'll just bring our formal meeting to a close. And we look forward to Wednesday night worship and worship next Sunday once again. Thank you. Our gracious God and our Father in heaven, we, we thank you once again for your goodness, for the blessings of today, for your word to us, a word that comes and, and that speaks to us in all the, the circumstances of life. And no matter what our, our situation is, Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the privilege of, of worship. We thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are united. We are one in him. However uh, different or varied we may be, we thank you that we come tonight as you, children to a father, as part of your family. We thank you for the witness and, and testimony of, of those uh, that we know. We thank you for Ruth's dad and for his a testimony and a faithfulness to you over uh, many years. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we think of, of him and, and of others, whom we may remember even at this time, we pray that you would help us to follow them, even as they followed the Christ. Lord, we thank you that we can commit ourselves to you, our loved ones, uh, at this time. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would do for us more than we can ask or think as we offer these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you very much. Well, friends, what better way could we be coming to the end of the Lord's day than to speak over one another these words that mean so much to William McEwen. Rest, O my soul, God has been good to you. May the Lord's blessing and peace be over each one of you and over all our homes. He is a good God. He has been good to us. And so our souls can rest in Christ, whose finished work is all we need and all we could possibly hope for. So grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Spirit be with you and with everyone whom we love. And thank you all for being together with our fellowship tonight. The Lord bless you and the Lord be with you. Lovely.